Welcome everyone. Glad to see you on my channel. Today I will tell you about an unusual story. An amazing story about companionship and love. I wish you a pleasant audience. No, I can't, moaned the man. You have to. The young girl answered him. Mom, go eat, I cooked, shouted the girl from the kitchen. I'll be right there, I'll be right there, the woman answered her. Maddie sat down at the table. She had already put everything on plates. She was afraid that it would get cold. What have you got there? Came into the kitchen, a woman of no age. Here, cooked porridge, smiled at her daughter in response. Good girl, kissed her mother, sat down at the table, and they started breakfast. Three years ago, it was a happy family, father, mother, and daughter. But now it was just the two of them. Harvey, why are you so late? Asked his wife when her husband came home from work at midnight. Business, he answered. The woman did not understand what kind of urgent business can have someone who collects furniture. And what, you couldn't put them off. She kept up with him as he went into the kitchen. Imagine I couldn't. Harvey looked at what was available at home for a snack. Sit down, I'll be right there. The wife came over to feed her husband. I'll do it myself, thank you. He was somehow frustrated. Twenty years ago, Harvey decided he was going to make custom furniture. He was good at it, but the money wasn't much. The man did everything with his own hands. He didn't have the space or the equipment. When he saved up, he was able to buy his first machine. The garage was cleared of all kinds of junk, and there he settled down. Maybe you should get someone to help you. His wife used to bring him lunch back in the day. No, I can do it all myself, he said. Well, work hard. I believe in you. She kissed her husband and went home. A year later, Harvey thought he could use a partner. He had a friend who did the same thing, but it was his hobby. Alex, come with me. The money, albeit small, but it is there, he called him then. Why not give it a try? Alex agreed. Years went by. The business grew. Now they moved from the garage to a bigger building. I'm so happy for you, the wife said in support of her husband at home. We haven't achieved everything yet, he sighed. And 15 years after starting it all, they had contracted with one and then several other firms. Now the finished equipment was coming to them. All they had to do was assemble it. Now the real earnings began. I'd go to work, Avi said and he'd be there 24 hours a day. His wife, Betty, never worked anywhere. Her husband insisted that he had to provide for the family. I guess that's what I'm going to do. The woman was sure of herself. Whatever you want, do what you do best, hugged her daughter. Maddie didn't ask her mother for anything. She understood how hard it was for her. She worked at jobs where she was very tired, but she received pennies for it. Can we buy you new boots? The woman asked her daughter. Mom, what boots? We barely make ends meet. Maddie looked reproachfully at her. She wore demi-seasonal boots in winter. It was cold, but the girl didn't complain about anything. She was showing her mother that everything was all right. She hadn't seen her father again since the divorce. Maddie was so resentful of him, primarily for her mother. Are you upset about something? A woman often came to see her and stood and stroked her daughter's head. First of all, because of you, the girl confessed to her. You don't need to think about me. Think about yourself. You still have your whole life ahead of you. She was worried that her husband had dealt a moral blow, not only to her, but also to her daughter. Okay, I'll get ready. Maddie sat at her books. I wish you only the best in life. Mom once again hugged and kissed her daughter and then went, she still had to clean all the entrances in their house. The girl had a graduation party ahead of her, but she knew by now that she wouldn't go to it. Why do you deprive yourself of such a holiday? The woman didn't understand. Why spend money on a dress? If I need it only once, the girl did not want to throw away so hard-earned money. Isn't your mother the best seamstress? Laughed the woman. Mom, calm down. Maddie has already decided everything for herself. But the woman didn't want to calm down. 
she spent a week picking out fabric from some old clothes. In a magazine, she saw a pattern that would be perfect for her daughter. A few weeks later, the dress was ready. So, do you want to see your new dress? The woman was worried because they hadn't had a single fitting. Mom, I asked. As much as Maddie didn't want to go to this prom, she couldn't say no to her mother. The girl realized she was trying for her, so she agreed to try it on. Oh, how beautiful it is. The woman looked at the girl when she put on the update. Maddie spun around in front of the mirror. It was a really fashionable and beautiful dress. She couldn't believe that her mom could make such a thing with her own hands. It's good that I have shoes, Maddie said, forgetting that she wasn't going anywhere. Her father had bought her shoes once. Maddie saw the shoes and couldn't resist asking her father for them, and he gave them to her. But there was nowhere to wear them, so she only wore them a couple times. It's a good thing the size hasn't changed. Maddie, what kind of dress you have? A classmate came up to her that night. She was an example for all the girls at school. Mom made it. She was shy. You what, really? I did not think that such a beauty can be simply sewn to order. Surprised that. From that moment, Betty had so many orders that she did not have time to sew. Girls wanted dresses, skirts, and other details of the closet. After graduation, the girl went to enroll. She was very nervous, after all, the first time she was in this city. It was very difficult. There was a big flow of three or four people for one place. When she found out that there were lists of enrolled, she did not dare to go to the board where they were posted. But when she looked and saw her surname, her heart beat more often in her chest. I got in. She shouted into the phone when she called her mother. Congratulations, sweetheart. But don't forget about your mom. Come visit at least once in a while. Mady heard her crying, but she didn't say anything. It was hard for her to be away from home because she was always with her mom. But to achieve something in life, she had to take a bold step, and she did it. Maddie did her best. She devoted herself to her studies. No partying, just textbooks and notes. You're so boring, said her roommate, with whom they lived together in the dormitory. I promised myself and my mother that I would graduate from this institute, and I will do it, no matter what it costs me, she was sure of herself. Maddie saw that many students found it easy to study. They could go out, have fun, and then come in and pass the session. Of course, they had only satisfactory, but the girl wanted to get only good and excellent. Clever girl, after the next exam, the teacher returned her credit card. Thank you. These words were like a balm on her soul. I don't know, I can go with you, but I won't take anything for myself. Maddie was still in her opinion. Okay, agreed her friend. They often went out in the evening, wandered around the city, sometimes going out to eat. Maddie never bought anything for herself. She liked practical clothes, like jeans, pullovers, sweaters. Of course, on any given workday, that's what she wore. But when she had to meet clients or go to a meeting, Maddie had to wear a dress. Well, you're not going to get away with it today, Selena looked at her. Okay, I agree with you. Let's go, Maddie told her, even though she didn't really want to go to the store. But when they went through her closet in the evening, the girl realized that she really didn't have a normal dress. And here they were in the store. One, one, two, three, nothing Maddie liked. Although Selena had said about some models that they were decent. This one is definitely cool turned Maddie's friend to the mirror. Yes, indeed it was okay. It was a solid colored dress with a light colored collar. It was both fashionable and austere at the same time. That's it, we'll take it, Selena turned to the counselor. Well, when Maddie saw the sum for this dress, she regretted that she had agreed to go with her friend to this store, but now there was nothing to do. It was necessary to pay for the purchase. The next day, the girl came to the office not in the same form as she was usually. Well, wow, Maddie, how good you can look, said her older colleague. Maddie was embarrassed at first, but then she got used to everyone staring at her today. Hurry up, 
We're late, Selina told her when everyone had already left for the meeting. Now hurried the girl, she was changing her boots for shoes. The girls went out into the corridor and hurried to the hall where the meeting was held. Everyone was already there, only the two of them were missing. Sorry for being late, they ran into the hall and took their seats, prepared to listen to what they would be told today. Nothing new was said, the same thing every time. The girls left the office, they were going to go to lunch. Maybe we should go home and change, Maddie turned to Selena, and at that moment, someone bumped into her. Something hot burned her leg. Oops, she pulled away. I'm sorry, for God's sake, picked her up off the floor by a young man. Don't you look where you're going, Maddie said to him. She saw that on the hem of the dress, which had been bought only yesterday, a coffee stain was spreading. It was an accident, I was talking, I didn't look, I apologize again. What can I do for you? There was a young man standing there saying a lot of words. Well, at the very least, you should pay for the dry cleaning of this dress, Selena told him hotly. She knew this man, he was the head of one of the departments, never paid attention to specialists. He treated them like servants. When can you give it to me? He looked at Maddie. Give me what? She didn't understand. Your dress, so I can take it to the dry cleaners. He was confused too. You don't have to give anything to anyone, Maddie said. She stood up, examined the leg, shook off the dress, took her friend's hand, and they walked down the hall. Come on, he has so much money, he could afford it. Selena couldn't calm down. Stop it, please. She didn't want to tell Maddie about it. They came into the study. Of course, there were no clothes here for the girl to change into. It was time to go home. Can you manage on your own? Selena asked her. She didn't really want to go home to Mai. Yes, of course. Maddie walked out of the building. She wanted to catch a cab and head towards home. Excuse me, girl. A young man approached her from behind. Yes. She turned around and saw the man who had just recently knocked her down and poured coffee on her. You again? Yes, I was looking for you, he said. If you want, I can take you to the store and buy you a new dress. He pointed to his car, which proved what he was saying. I wouldn't mind you giving me a ride, but I don't need to buy a dress. Maddie tried to behave appropriately. Okay, where are we going? He asked as they got into the car. Maddie told him the address and they drove off. You don't owe me anything, the girl told him. She didn't look at him, just forward. What are you talking about? If someone knocked me down like that, I would definitely demand compensation. He was sure of it. Thank you. I'll be fine if you bring me home, wait for me and then take me back. And why didn't she think to ask about it before, in case he didn't have time? Okay, I'll wait for you. He didn't finish the sentence, he stopped talking. Why did you stop? She asked him. I just wanted to call you by your name, but I realized I didn't know your name, he turned to her. My name is Maddie, she said. Mickey, he introduced himself. Nice to meet you, she smiled to herself, because she hadn't heard names like that in a long time. The young man waited for the girl to change and then, when she got into the car, they drove off. I hope to see you again, Mickey said. And I hope not. She didn't turn to him, but walked up the steps. Wow, that was fast, her friend told her. Mickey drove me there and back, she told her. Who's Mickey? She was quiet at first, but then she realized who Maddie was talking about. Come on, he's a cheapskate, Selena said. What's that got to do with it? Maddie didn't understand her. No matter who asked him for a ride, he would never waste a drop of gasoline, said her friend. He wouldn't waste a drop of gas on anyone, but he gave me a ride, Maddie shrugged. Nothing else interesting happened that day, so the girls went home unhindered. But the next day, when Maddie went to work, Mickey was already standing in his car at her driveway. Hello, young lady, do you need a ride? He opened the door for her. No, thanks, I'll do it myself. Maddie was sure of herself. Tell me, why don't you want to talk to me? Mickey was riding next to her. Why don't I want to communicate? We do. She didn't look at him at all. But I can see you're avoiding me, 
He was looking at the road, then at her. How could you see that when we only met yesterday? Maidy really didn't want to have any affairs at work. Get in, it's a long walk, Mickey insisted. Okay, finally, agreed Maddie. She thought it would be easier for her to get in his car than for him to follow her like that and attract attention. Was it just me, or did he bring you to work again? Selena asked her this morning. He did, her friend admitted to her. And what does that mean? You said yesterday that you don't feel anything for anyone. They were sitting in their office. It really doesn't mean anything. I don't understand why he's picking on me. Maddie switched on her computer, making it look like she wasn't going to talk anymore. That evening, Mickey was waiting for her again. He wanted to give her a ride home. Mickey, you realize that everyone can see. I don't want people to start gossiping about us, she told him as they drove home. We're adults. Just because someone likes someone doesn't mean it's shameful, the young man answered her. Even though Maddie was of the same opinion, she was still very shy. She was afraid of being judged, that they would say she was flirting with a male boss to show up in some position. What are you imagining? It's not like that, he told her. Let's meet tonight at the restaurant. His proposal was very unexpected, but the girl thought about it. Selena, he invites me to the restaurant. What to do? She called her friend. What to do? Put on a beautiful dress, shoes and go, she told her. It's our first date. I don't even know. Maddie was always second-guessing everything. Okay, I'll come over and we'll make you look like candy, her friend suggested. Come over, was all Maddie said and disconnected. Selena was here in a few minutes. She went through Maddie's entire closet, but there was nothing except the dress they bought. So the girl took the austere pants from the suit and told Maddie to put a white shirt on top, as well as a vest. Now that's a look. She stepped back a little to look at Maddie. Are you sure you can wear that to a restaurant? Maddie certainly understood a little about fashion, but she was still a little hesitant. She put on some makeup, styled her hair, and was ready to go. Is he picking himself up, or do you need to be there already? Selena was curious about everything. I don't know. We didn't talk about it. I'll probably go myself. The girls called a cab, and Maddie drove to her first date in her life. We should have said I'd pick you up, right? Mickey was the first to say. He was meeting her at the entrance to the restaurant. It's okay. I got a cab just fine, Maddie told him, ashamed for some reason. They went inside and sat down at a table. Mickey looked at his companion and couldn't take his eyes off her. Why are you looking at me like that? She asked him. You're very beautiful, Mickey admitted. All the evening they talked. Mickey asked how and where Maddie studied, where she had lived before. The girl told him, but some information she simply omitted. You are so unusual, modest. There are few of them left now, the young man told her. When Maddie got to know him better, she also liked him because earlier they said different things about him. Shall I pick you up at work tomorrow? He asked her when they were saying goodbye. No, I think it's too early for the two of us to be traveling together. She wanted to leave, but he took her hand, pulled her close to him, and kissed her cheek. Do you think it's time? Maddie looked at him. But I'm just being childish, he smiled. Maddie walked into the entryway where she lived, one cheek burning intensely from the hot kiss that Mickey had left behind. Right now, she was definitely realizing that she liked this man. But what to do about the job? She couldn't quit. The next day, Selena stayed close to Maddie. She had to find out everything thoroughly. What they talked about, where they sat, what he was wearing, what he said when he said goodbye. I told you it went well, Maddie told her. Okay, you don't want to talk, don't talk, went the offended girl back to her table. That evening, Mickey waited for Maddie outside the office. When she came out, he opened the door for her, gave her his hand defiantly, and put her in the car. Why did you do that? She asked him. I want everyone to know that we're together now so that you won't be embarrassed about anything and behave as usual. No one will say or think anything, he assured her. Hopefully, 
that would be the case, they drove off to get something to eat somewhere. The young man and the girl started dating. Now from and to work, on their lunch break, they were always together. As Mickey got to know Selena better, he realized she was nothing like Maddie. How did you two manage to become friends? He was very surprised by that. I don't even know, we just hit it off, Maddie shrugged. She liked being with Selena. She had a lot of fashion advice, and she knew a lot about other subjects. No, I'm not saying you're friends, it's just interesting, two very different personalities, and you're together. The three of them often got together in Maddie's kitchen, at places, it was fun. Maddie, you and I have been together for a few months now, maybe we should live together. Mickey asked her one day. What? I thought people got married before they moved in together, she said. Well, if you want, I can make you an offer. If I have a wife like that, I won't mind at all, he laughed. Mickey, stop it. She didn't like his jokes. What did I say, Mady, marry me? He got down on one knee in front of her. Are you joking now? She didn't understand. What kind of jokes are there? He was completely serious. Okay, I agree, she loved this man and realized that he was good not only in work, but also in life, in vain about him other people thought so. He wasn't like that with her. So I guess it's time for you and your mom to meet, how are you? Mickey came to pick her up in the evening. I'm not ready, she answered quickly. Maddie knew who Mickey's mother was, she was an executive at a financial firm. So, what, are you going to hide from her all the time? Did not understand the young man. Why hide? We'll get acquainted a little later. I'm not ready now. The girl didn't know what to say. Okay. Then next week was Adam and Mickey. He lived together with his mom in a big house, so sooner or later Maddie would have to meet her anyway. So, are you ready? He came to pick her up over the weekend. No, she lowered her eyes. Maddie, don't be silly. You still have to meet her, he told the girl. She got in the car and they drove to Mickey's house. Hello, Maddie walked into the apartment. Why are you so embarrassed? Come in, Mickey took her bag and coat from her. Wouldn't you have been embarrassed the first time we came to my mom's house? She looked at him. I don't know how I would have behaved, the man answered honestly. A woman came out into the hallway. She looked good. Her hair was pulled back in a bun on her head. Did you bring her? She said, looking at the girl. Mom, we had a deal. Mickey couldn't understand why his mother was acting like this. Okay, come in, she pointed to the table that was set. Maddie could see that the woman was unhappy with her presence, but she couldn't do anything about it. They sat down at the table. The girl looked that all the dishes were unfamiliar to her. She noted to herself that Sarah must have ordered these dishes on purpose to see how Maddie would eat them, evaluating the future daughter-in-law. And where did you come from, my dear? She asked her. My name is Mady. She looked into the woman's eyes without fear. Well, where do you come from, Maddie? She emphasized the last word. I'm from a small provincial town. I lived there with my mom. Then I went to college, graduated, and now I'm working in a firm with Mickey Mari, as if she was preparing for this question. Well, what do you think? A man who has well-to-do parents, a house, a car, and everything else, would take you as his wife. She didn't shy away from these questions. I guess that's for Mickey to decide. Maddie kept looking at her. Sometimes a person needs to be told what choice to make, Sarah sighed. And what, you're against your son meeting and being friends with girls, interrupted Maddie. Why would I be against it? Against people like you, she rolled her eyes and continued her meal. Mom, why are you talking like that now? Maddie is my fiancé, and it's not negotiable, Mickey interjected. Well, where are you going to live? She asked her son. Maddie is renting an apartment. We can live there. He knew she wouldn't let him go anywhere. No, my dear children, you will live here. And if you want to go somewhere else, then know that not the post, nothing else will not see you like your ears. 
she put conditions to him. The evening ended, and Maddie waited for it to end. After that Mickey put her in the car, Maddie drove to her house. Why is your mom so strict? Who cares what city I come from? If we love each other, and we are doing well, why can't we be together? Maddie had a million questions. You do not pay much attention to her. She can check you in this way. The young man justified his mother. I don't need any checks, the girl said resentfully. Now she was no longer so sure that she wanted to live with this man. So, what? You're going to reject me just because of mom? He didn't believe it. No, of course not, she hugged him. Mickey and Maddie continued their meetings. Maddie's rent was due again. Last time she had paid a year in advance, now she didn't know what to do. Let's go. A young man came to see her. Where to? She didn't know they were going out today. You'll see, he gave her his hand. It didn't take long. After a while, the car stopped at the registry office. What, Mickey, are you kidding? She looked at him. Why, no, it was just a statement. It's like hell, Mady admitted. Why is that, mother-in-law? She didn't understand. Who else? She sighed. Yes, it's hard, Selena nodded. But Mickey had promised his wife that they would move soon. They needed his mother to calm down. Six months after the wedding, Mickey and Mady came home in the evening. It was business as usual. Hello, son. Sarah approached Mickey. She always ignored Mari. What smells so good? Do we have guests? The young man knew that the woman only made her own pies when she had guests. Yes, Victoria came to see us, remember? You went to school with her? Her mother was talking and she didn't even notice that Maddie was standing next to her. Mom, what Victoria? I'm married. He looked at his wife. So what? Once you're married, you're divorced. Victoria works in an international organization. She has a serious position. It seems to me that you are very suitable for each other. Could not calm down mother-in-law. Altogether, they went to the table. There was a girl sitting there. She was smiling. Hello. She looked at Mickey. Hello, he squinted at Mari. I should probably go to my room, she said. No, you should stay here too. Her mother-in-law stopped her. Maddie realized that her mother-in-law was just trying to humiliate her. Mom, that's the height of insolence. Mickey raised his voice. He took his wife's hand and they left the kitchen. Let's move, Maddie asked for the umpteenth time. We would, but a little later, she didn't know why her son was clinging so tightly to his mother's skirt. But Sarah wasn't going to give up. She was coming up with more and more plans to get her daughter-in-law out of her son's life. I think we're going to have a little one soon, Maddie told her husband. I think, or are you sure? He clarified. I don't know, but by all accounts she had already made a doctor's appointment, but she couldn't bear to tell Mickey. In the evenings, the same thing happened again. While the family ate dinner, she would hear so much from her mother-in-law that Maddie had no desire to go out with them. Mom, why are you acting like this? For the thousandth time, Mickey asked. What am I to do? If this Maddy is not your match, even if it takes a year or two, I won't put up with it, she sat stony-faced. And if I told you Maddie was expecting a baby, he'd wait to see what the mother would say. Are you sure the baby is yours? She asked. What are you talking about? Of course I'm sure. He got up from the table. Do you know where she was when you went on a business trip? The mother-in-law noticed that the timing was just right. She was staying at a friend's house, so that not with you. The young man was already walking with his back to the woman. And not at a friend's, and the girlfriend just covered up. The woman said sarcastically, God, calm down already. He was going to his wife. What? Did you have another fight? Maddie was waiting for him in the room. A little, he didn't bother to tell his wife the details of the conversation. Mickey, maybe we'll move out, rent an apartment, we'll live separately. Now the little one will still appear, she begged her husband. Okay, I'll think about it. He began to think about it himself. 
Mickey really for the first time began to look for an apartment. He wanted the child was born in a quiet family, not where they are always yelling. He decided to initially rent a place to live and start saving for his own. Some savings the young man had, but there was a lot missing. Mom, soon we will move out from you, he told her. What, yes, how can you leave a native man, swap me for this, began to cry woman. Actually, this is my wife, and will soon give birth to my son. Mickey could not listen to any more of this talk. The child is not yours, I saw her driving with her colleagues. One drives there, the other back, went to your mother-in-law's bank. Don't make it up. Mickey went to his room. The mother was angry. She couldn't believe her son could move out on her. He'd always been a quiet boy who listened to her. And that now, some redneck came and stole him away from her, and her favorite son would just leave. If you leave now, I will never speak to you again, she shouted to her son and daughter-in-law. Fine, Maddie would answer her. She would only cross herself if it were true. Why are you getting her all riled up? Mickey didn't like it when Maddie answered her mother. He found the right apartment. They moved in. Finally, you can go where you want, do what you want, Maddie told her husband. Come here, he held out his arms to her. It's okay, she kissed him. The family began to live their lives without anyone's advice. Maddie was still a couple months away from giving birth, and she was on maternity leave. One night they were having dinner when the doorbell rang. Are you expecting someone? Maddie looked at her husband. No, he shook his head negatively. Mickey went to open the door, very surprised to see his mother. What are you doing here? He made big eyes and turned to Maddie. Hello, son, she said, and headed straight for the kitchen. Hello, Maddie in the kitchen choked when she saw who came in. Maddie, how are you feeling? The mother-in-law was different. I'm fine, she looked at her husband. Here, I brought you some goodies and vitamins, she put the bag on the floor. Mom, what happened to you? Mickey couldn't believe the woman's miraculous transformation. Nothing, I was angry with you for a long time, and then I thought, why be angry, after all, one family? I realized everything and decided to come and repent. She sat down on a chair. It's good that you understood everything, smiled the son. Mickey walked over to the woman. He hugged his mother. Maddie looked at all of this and couldn't believe that this could have happened. But she wanted to believe in good things, so she made herself believe. Oh, that's it, kids. I see you're doing well. I'm going home then, Sarah said goodbye to everyone and headed for the exit. Well, you come back, Mickey told her. I will, and you come and visit me. It was as if the woman had had some kind of psychotherapy, because she wasn't like that now. Do you believe it? Maddie asked her husband as the door closed behind the woman. I don't even know what to tell you, he said honestly, because it was the first time he'd seen mom like that. Okay, we'll see what happens next. Maddie tried to believe her, but still, she couldn't do it. They went on with their lives. Her mother-in-law came every day now. She brought something prepared. She gave Maddie advice on how to sleep, how to sit, what to eat, and so on. The girl listened to her, but mostly relied only on herself, and her mother always helped on the phone. Once Mickey came home, he said that he had decided to take an apartment in the mortgage. Would it be convenient now that the baby was coming? Mady asked him. What's the difference between paying the landlord or making payments, but for your own place? He answered her. Good. Then I agree. Maddie never argued with her husband when he talked to her about such things. While she was pregnant, they bought a condo. It needed renovations. Everything was fine. Even when her mother-in-law came over, they didn't have any strong conflicts. But when the baby came into the world, that's when Maddie realized that Sarah was more pretending than telling the truth. Maddie started going to different doctors with the baby. Some she needed help lifting the stroller, some she needed help getting it down. So, what? You're telling me you're not dating this young man? Her mother-in-law put the pictures on the table in front of her. Sarah. Shame on you, 
This man who just helped me lift the straw- Yes, yes, I saw that you and he came to the clinic together, you gave birth to some poor man, and you married my son, and you want to slip him a child, right? She said to her. What are you talking about? Maddie started crying. Oh, cry. Tears will not help the grief. As soon as I show these pictures to my son, he will immediately leave you. The woman told her. Maddie did whatever she wanted because she was really afraid that Mickey might listen to her mom. Sarah blossomed. She realized she could manipulate her daughter-in-law, and now she was doing whatever she wanted. So, when are you moving in? She asked her son in the evening. I don't know. It's pretty much finished, just a little bit left in the nursery, and then we can move in, Mickey told her. Maddie watched them talk. She felt bad that she had to pretend now that her mother-in-law was like that. Well, happy housewarming, love. Mickey raised his glass. They moved into the new apartment this morning. The son was already asleep in his crib and the parents were sitting in the kitchen. I hope we live a long and happy life, Maddie told him. When is your mom coming to visit? Her husband asked her. I called her, she's sick, so she can't, she said sadly. The next day, Maddie decided to go to work to meet Selena there. She told her husband about it. He didn't mind. Of course, she took her son with her. She walked and rolled the stroller ahead of her. Selena was very happy that the girl came to her. They decided to take a walk in the park after work. While the girls were walking, they met a group of guys. Selena, hi, heard the girl. Oh, Barry. She looked at the guys. Wait, Maddie. Let's go introduce them. Okay, agreed her friend. This is Barry, who we haven't met that long ago, but have met a couple times. They walked over to the young men. Barry was with a friend. They sat on a bench, chatted, and then Barry's friend volunteered to walk Marty home. Oh, come on, don't do that, she said. What do you mean don't? A young mom, alone, with a stroller. What if something happens? Billy, Barry's friend, said calmly. They walked down the alley, turned onto the driveway, and two houses later, Maddie was already in her driveway. Thank you, she told him. You're welcome. And Billy pressed himself against the girl. Maddie actually thought he wanted to kiss her, but she turned her head away, and it turned out to be a tight hug. The girl looked around, but no one was around. When they got home, Mickey had long since had dinner. How do you explain this to me? He showed her his phone with pictures of her walking down the alley with Billy and the stroller. Honey, your mom set it all up, Maddie began to say. It was the only option she could think of. What are you saying? Why do you always say things like that about my mother? He didn't understand. What if it's true, she cried. I can see with my own eyes that you are walking with a young man. He kept showing that picture. You see, Selena met a guy, they started dating, and it was his friend who offered to walk me. She began to justify herself. Okay, what's this then? Maddie's biggest fear was that he would show her those pictures. They were of her and Billy hugging. I don't know, maybe he's in the habit of saying goodbye, she said. Yeah, yeah, I'm supposed to believe you. The mother had gotten her son so worked up that he had these doubts about his wife creeping into his head. And now that he'd seen those pictures, he believed his mother more than he believed Maddie. Mickey, where are you going? She saw him leaving. Maddie, I'm not saying I'm leaving you, but I need to live alone. I'm going to my mom's, and you stay in the apartment. He was totally calm. Please, my love, it's just pictures. I'll prove to you that there is nothing between us, cried the girl. I want to believe you, but I believe my mother too. He put on his shoes and left the apartment. Maddie immediately took out her cell phone and dialed her mother-in-law's number. Why are you doing this? She asked her. Why do what? She didn't understand. You're the one who downloaded the pictures of Mickey, she yelled. And what? Why shouldn't my son know the truth? that his wife is walking left and right. Pretended that she was right, but Maddie was not. Do you realize you're ruining the family? We have a child, 
she told her. Goodbye, Maddie, and be warned, if Mickey files for divorce, there will be no property division, she hung up. What to do, Maddie didn't understand. She sat in the kitchen, her son was asleep. Just what to find a way out, the girl had no money, she couldn't rent an apartment herself, but she couldn't go to her mother either. Realized that if the woman found out that she was having a hard time, she would get all sorts of hard jobs again, and for her health now, it was very bad. Maddie dialed Selena's number. Hi, friend, she told her. And then she told her what had happened when they'd broken up in the park. God, what does she want from you? She didn't understand. You know, maybe you can find some information about her that you can blackmail her with. That was Selena's suggestion. What can I find about her? Do you think she led an immoral life as a child? Laughed Madi. Well, what if, go to the archives, ask people who saw her or knew her, you'll find out something, Selena insisted. Okay, I'll try to do something, but I promised nothing, because to live as I live with my mother-in-law is impossible. Either she accepts my existence or Mickey, and I will never be together. Maddie hung up the phone. She went into the next room to see how her son was doing and went back into the kitchen. She began to think about her friend's words. The first thing the girl did was to type her mother-in-law's first name, last name, middle name in the search box. But except for her website in one popular social network, she didn't see anything else. Then Maddie tried to dial Mickey's number, but he didn't pick up the phone. In the morning, the girl got ready, took the baby with her, and went to the local archives. Hello, she walked through the door. Hello, how can I help you? A woman came out to meet her. You know, I work from home, remotely. I write articles for the magazine, and I wanted to write about a hard worker who worked all her life in the financial sector. Maddie began to compose. Of course, who exactly are you interested in? Was interested in the archivist. Sarah, who is now the head of finance. Oh yes, of course, it is worth writing about her. She has done a lot for the city, she said, and at that moment went to look for documents. The woman returned after a while with a weighty folder. Here it is, she said. In the folder were clippings from newspapers, from books, from other sources. Maddie began to read. There was a lot of interesting stuff in there. For one thing, she learned that Sarah's last name was not what it is now. Maddie wrote it all down on a piece of paper she took pictures. She read everything she was given. It turned out that Sarah had been born in a different town. And the most important thing Maddie found out was that the woman had been raised in an orphanage. This information the girl recorded exactly. Selena, can you come to my place? She called her friend when she got home. Sure, what's wrong? She wondered. I'll explain everything to you, only later, if everything works out. Maddie was very excited. The friend arrived, and they were in the kitchen. Well, tell me, Selena couldn't wait to know everything the girl had learned. Wait, I have a favor to ask you. Her friend stopped her. Tell me, what is it? She stared. Can you stay for a while with my baby? I need to go somewhere. Maddie asked Selena. Sure, just on the weekend, agreed her friend. Great, then I'll see you on Saturday. She still hadn't told anyone anything today. Maddie made plans to go to that very orphanage to find out what it was like to be a child of this strict woman who tried to ruin her life. On her day off, she went to the train station, bought a ticket to the desired locality. When the bus stopped there, Maddie got off. She looked around. She also told me I came from the middle of nowhere, she muttered to herself. But time was short so she had to go where she wanted to go. She approached the gate of the orphanage, and a man in a guard's uniform came up to her. Hello, could I speak to the director of this institution? She asked politely. Of course, the man smiled. He opened the wicket, and Maddie stepped inside. She quickly found the office she needed, knocked. Come in, she heard, and opened the doors. Good afternoon. She walked through and sat down in a chair. What can I do for you? A man sat behind the director's desk. 
He was young, so he could hardly have worked here years ago. You know, I'm on such a delicate request. My mother-in-law, she put a picture on the table, wants to find her relatives. What do you want me to do? Looking at that old picture, I know that she was brought up in this orphanage, so I decided to start with you, said Maddie, and herself, all the while smiling. You know, ten years ago we had a fire, a lot of documents were burned, so I don't think there's anything to be found out, he said. Is there anyone still alive who worked here then? She asked. I don't know. He scratched the back of his head. You haven't had any employees since then. She kept up. Go down the corridor. You'll meet an old woman. She's our cleaning lady. Maybe she can help you. The director told her. Thank you. Maddie left the office. She walked down the hallway and saw a woman standing at the very end with a mop in her hands. Hello. Excuse me. Could I talk to you for a moment? She asked the woman. About what? She couldn't understand. Look, maybe you knew this girl. She was brought up with you. She showed Maddie again a picture of Sarah at the age of about 17. No, she shook her head as if shaking something off. On her day off, she went to the train station, bought a ticket to the desired locality. When the bus stopped there, Maddie got off. She looked around. She also told me I came from the middle of nowhere, she muttered to herself. But time was short, so she had to go where she wanted to go. She approached the gate of the orphanage, and a man in a guard's uniform came up to her. Hello, could I speak to the director of this institution? She asked politely. Of course, the man smiled. He opened the wicket, and Maddie stepped inside. She quickly found the office she needed, knocked. Come in, she heard, and opened the doors. Good afternoon, she walked through and sat down in a chair. What can I do for you? A man sat behind the director's desk. He was young, so he could hardly have worked here years ago. You know, I'm on such a delicate request. My mother-in-law, she put a picture on the table, wants to find her relatives. What do you want me to do? Looking at that old picture. I know that she was brought up in this orphanage, so I decided to start with you, said Maddie, and herself all the while smiling. You know, ten years ago we had a fire, a lot of documents were burned, so I don't think there's anything to be found out, he said. Is there anyone still alive who worked here then? She asked. I don't know, he scratched the back of his head. You haven't had any employees since then? She kept up. Go down the corridor. You'll meet an old woman. She's our cleaning lady. Maybe she can help you, the director told her. Thank you. Maddie left the office. She walked down the hallway and saw a woman standing at the very end with a mop in her hands. Hello. Excuse me. Could I talk to you for a moment? She asked the woman. About what? She couldn't understand. Look, maybe you knew this girl. She was brought up with you. I'll leave room for the young, said Sarah. Finally, the son hugged his mother. Maddie, I'm sorry again. She held out her arms to her daughter-in-law. It's okay. The important thing now is to get Samuel back on her feet. They hugged again. Who would have thought it could end this way? The husband and wife walked out of the apartment. Samantha was on her way home for vacation in her small town, which was located near Dallas. The girl was in her third year at an economic institute and dreamed of becoming an accountant in the future. Samanda anticipated the joy of meeting her parents, and she also thought about how she would tell her mother and father that they would soon become grandparents. As soon as the girl thought about her pregnancy, her face frowned. Samanda found out about it a week ago, and at first she was happy about the event. The girl immediately decided to notify her chosen one that he would soon become a father. With a young man Samanda met at the skating rink in Dallas, she accidentally ran over a guy and knocked him down while skating. 25-year-old Steve found himself on the ice laughing from this fall, and the girl was embarrassed that she had so ridiculously run over the man. Steve, seeing Samanda's embarrassment, said cheekily, Why are you blushing like a shy girl? Not everyone here is an excellent skater, 
and quite often there are such collisions on the ice. Better let's get up and skate together. It's my first time here, although I am from this city. It's my third time here. My classmate invited me once. I went and liked it, so I come here occasionally. Samamba said, getting to her feet. So you study here? A student, I take it. The boy said with a smile. That's right. Soon there will be one more accountant in the country, said the girl. After that, the young people got acquainted, and after the skating rink, they sat in a cozy cafe and talked nicely. Since then, they called each other for a few days and then started to meet. A month after meeting, the girl realized that she fell in love with the young man, and soon they had a passionate night in the arms. Samanda then often stayed overnight at Steve's place, his mother, Natalie on these relationships, looked through her fingers. The woman did not believe that her son was serious about this girl. She was just waiting for Steve to play with the student and then leave her. It had already happened a couple of times in his life. And so just a week before Samanda to go home, then the girl found out that she was pregnant. A few days before this news, Samanda had already agreed with her lover that they would go together to her parents but it was only worth it for the girl to inform the guy about the pregnancy, as Steve gave a bunch of reasons about the fact that he could not go. And also the young man casually said, you think about terminating the pregnancy, you need to learn first and only then think about offspring. At that moment, the girl erupted with indignation and almost hysterically screamed, are you saying that you don't need our child with you? Maybe you don't need me either. Let's not have this cheap drama, we're not in the theatre. I just let you know that I'm not ready to become a father yet. I need to wait a little longer. Steve said with a little irritation. You know what it's called. I mean your behaviour at the moment. It's hit it and quit it. Samanda said holding back tears. Look, baby, let's not fight. You'll go to your family, get some rest, and then you'll think it over. I'm just telling you that you caught me off guard with your pregnancy announcement, and I really don't think I'm ready to be a father at this point in my life," Steve said. You're going to be a great dad, I know you are. You were just not ready for such a turn of events," said the girl, who thought that she had shot the young man with the news of her pregnancy, and therefore, the lover had such a reaction. And now Samanda was going home by train and thought about how to tell her parents about the pregnancy. She was well aware that at home, they would start asking about the father of the future child, and she had nothing to say in response, because she did not know the decision of her boyfriend. The girl was right. As soon as she came to her parents and reported the pregnancy, then the mother, Leslie immediately asked a few questions. Who is your boyfriend? How many years? When is the wedding? Mom, so many questions that you do not know which one to answer first, quietly said the girl. And you in order and do not rush. After all, my father and I are worried about you, said the mother. Mammy, we can talk about this topic alone, Samanda said even more quietly. Leslie frowned after these words, she already felt anxious for her daughter. The woman saw how her husband wanted to get indignant, so she asked him affectionately, to let him talk to Samanda alone. The girl's father, Jack, did not object to his spouse and silently left the room. As soon as the door closed behind the man, Leslie looked expectantly at her daughter. Samanda saw the look of her mother and did not delay the conversation and quietly said, Mammy, I do not know how to tell you. In general, I'll tell you how it is. I got pregnant from my favorite man, but he is not ready to become a father. I gave him time to think about it while I'm with you. What do you mean he's not ready? Jumping and tumbling in bed with you means you're ready. I don't understand you, daughter, frankly. You have to realize that time is running out and your due date is getting longer every day. I'm saying that you can terminate a pregnancy up to a certain point, said the mother. Mom, I'm gonna have a baby. I'm not going to terminate the pregnancy. I'm just sure that even if Steve refuses the baby now, he will definitely, as soon as the baby is born and he looks at it, he will come back to me, said the girl. What a fool you are, Leslie said sadly, 
and after a few minutes of silence continued talking. It is impossible to tie a man to yourself with a child. You have to decide for yourself. You need a child or not. In any case, do not mean to give birth for someone else. You need to realize that you want this baby and ready to bring him up due to different circumstances yourself. I will give birth. And despite everything, I believe that Steve will be with me, said the girl with pressure. Well, that's your decision. I'm not the boss of you, and I'm not going to push you around. Under any circumstances, my father and I will be happy to hold a grandson or granddaughter. Don't worry about daddy, I'll explain everything to him, said Leslie. Thanks mom. You supported me a lot now, but I didn't expect anything else from you, said the girl with tears in her eyes. The vacations flew by, and Samanda left her parents for her studies. The girl hoped that the guy would think over everything during this time and would be happy about the baby. However, her expectations were not justified. As soon as she met with the young man, Steve immediately said that they would not meet again. The girl looked perplexed at her lover, and he in turn said that he no longer had feelings for Samanda. After this brief conversation, the young woman came to her senses for a long time. She could not believe that the chosen one so simply, without any apparent reason, took her and left her. Samanda experienced the breakup for several days and then decided that so easily will not let the guy forget about her. The girl dared to talk to Steve's mother. She thought Natalie would influence her son. And soon Samanda was sitting at the guy's house and talking to the landlady. The girl deliberately seized the moment when the chosen one was not at home. Samanda told Natalie about the pregnancy and the fact that Steve had turned away from her. The boyfriend's mother listened to the girl and calmly said, Why did you come here? I did not put you in bed with my son. And you know very well that after bedding there can be children. As they say, I didn't set you up and I didn't divorce you. And now, if my son is called to you, it's not in my power to make him feel for you again. But you must talk to him, because I am carrying his child under my heart and your grandson or granddaughter, said the girl. Wait, my dear. You can't claim that it is my son's child, so don't attribute to me the kinship with your unborn child. And lastly, I'll ask you not to bother me with your visits anymore. I hope I have made myself clear to you, Natalie said haughtily. Yes, how dare you say that to me? You've seen that I've spent many nights at your place, Samanda said indignantly. I don't argue, but who slept with you the other nights? The landlady smirked and looked at the girl with a contemptuous look and said, I hope we won't see you again. After these words, Samanda ran out of the apartment. She felt that she was going to cry from helplessness. And only when Samanda returned to the dormitory, she gave herself the freedom of emotion. She hugged her pillow and cried. Several months flew by. During this period of time, Samanda repeatedly tried to talk to Steve, but the man behaved coldly and sometimes hostile towards her. All this the girl silently bore. She hoped in her heart that as soon as the baby is born, the lover will stop treating her like this. Soon Samanda went on maternity leave, took a leave of absence, and went to her parents, as in this city could not stay, because it was necessary to rent an apartment, and the girl had no extra money for this luxury. However, leaving home she decided that as soon as she gave birth, she would come to Steve again with the baby, the sex of the child at that time, Samanda already knew. It wasn't long before the young woman gave birth to a healthy baby girl, whom she named Julia. Samanda gently looked at her daughter, noting that the baby looks very much like her lover. The girl was happy about this circumstance. She thought that Steve would not be able to push away Julia, who looked like two drops like him. Samanda told her mother about it. Leslie, when she heard it, said, I thought you'd wise up. Julia may look like her biological father, but that has no bearing on the guy wanting to live for his daughter with you. I'm pretty sure Steve and I are going to be together. And when Julia is three months old, we will go to her father's house, the young woman said. Leslie said nothing in response, 
as she saw that it was useless to dissuade her daughter. The woman decided to let Samanda be convinced by her bitter experience, and maybe then her life would teach her something. When Julia was three months old, Samanda packed for Dallas. She sacredly believed that now she would definitely reunite with the man she loved. However, a disappointment awaited the young woman. Steve, as soon as he saw Samanda with a child in his arms on the threshold of the apartment, he immediately declared that it was not his daughter. Samanda was angered by these words and said that she would establish paternity in court. The man, hearing the words of the ex-girlfriend Riley uttered, Go ahead and with a song. But only you will make an examination, then I can tell you right away, that then I will put all the money and connections to deprive you of motherhood. And believe me, I can do it. Now the choice is yours. You have two choices, and I'm going to tell you what they are. First, you leave now and forget the way here, and also forget about my coexistence, as well as I about yours. And the second option is that you may go to court, the consequences of which I have already told you afterwards. You rascal, exclaimed the girl. How? Only a few minutes ago said words of love, and now you call me names. You have no right to be misunderstood. And if I am a scoundrel, then why did you tumble in bed with me then? said the man with a grin. I hate you, said the young woman. Samantha returned home in a depressed state. She thought about Steve's words about the trial. She wondered to herself whether the guy was bluffing about the deprivation of motherhood or not. As soon as the young woman arrived home, she told her mother about everything. Leslie, after telling her daughter, hugged Samantha and advised her to forget the former chosen one and never remember about him. However, the ghoul bitterly said, I am now gnawing with resentment, and I cannot just leave this situation. After all, in fact, Steve accused me of being a slutty girl. I want to prove to him and his mom that I'm not. Specifically, a paternity test. Look, sweet girl, I know you're emotional after this, but you need to find the strength to just forget about that guy. And what if he will carry out his threat, and you will lose your daughter, especially you said that his mother works in the administration? Just think about it. Is it worth it? I wouldn't do it if I were you, Leslie said. Samanda thought about her mother's words, and then looked at Julia, who was sleeping peacefully in the children's bed. She thought about what her mother had said for a long time, and finally came to the conclusion that it was not worth stirring up a hornet's nest. Samanda decided that she would simply cross out of the memory of her former lover once and for all. Time moved on and soon Samanda's sabbatical was coming to an end. The girl's mother offered her daughter to resume her studies. Samanda looked at her mother, perplexed at that moment, and asked, What about Julia? She is still just a baby, isn't she? Don't worry about Julia. I am retired and I will be able to babysit her, but you will come here more often. Why should you waste your time? You don't have much time left before graduation, said Leslie. But in principle, your mom is right. I'll finish my studies and get a job. We could use an extra penny now, said the girl. Samantha returned to the institute. She called home almost every day to find out how Julia was doing. The young woman missed her daughter very much and dreamed of graduating as soon as possible in order to return home to her baby. Samantha rarely thought about Steve, and when she arrived in Dallas, she did not even try to make him. Time flew by and Samantha was triumphantly returning home. She had graduated, and now she planned to get a job in the near future. As soon as she arrived home, she hugged her little girl and said, You are growing by leaps and bounds. How glad I am that now you will be near your mother. After these words, Samantha looked at her mother and saw her red eyes. The girl asked anxiously, have you been crying? We have daddy in the hospital. They took him away by ambulance last night. The doctors say he doesn't have long to live. Leslie said through her tears, what's wrong with him? He's never complained about his health, said Samanda. He's been complaining about chest pains lately and I've been chasing him to the hospital, but he's as stubborn as you are. 
Yesterday, he had a seizure and I called an ambulance. I went with Julia to see him this morning, but they wouldn't let me see my husband, the woman said. Mom, please don't worry. Everything will be fine. You just have to believe in it. Our daddy is strong, and at Julia's wedding he'll go out. And doctors can be wrong in their diagnosis. Trying not to cry, said the girl, who was stunned by the news of her mother. Two days later, Leslie's husband died in the hospital. Then the funeral took place. The widow was sobbing in the cemetery, her daughter comforting her as best she could. Samanda realized that now there was nothing she could do to help her mother cope with grief, and she herself felt the loss of her father very much. It had been a month since the funeral, and Leslie had aged a great deal during that period of time. Samanda knew that her mother had given up because of her husband's death. The girl tried to cheer up her mom, but she only smiled sadly in response. So Samanda got a job as an accountant in a small firm, the young woman wanted to work on her specialty in the bank, but all the places that there were staffed. The girl did not become upset about this and decided first to gain practice and eventually moved to work in a public institution. And now Julia was three years old and Samanda gave the girl to a kindergarten so that her daughter would have contact with her peers. Leslie was against it. The woman wanted her granddaughter to stay at home for some time. But Samanda stood her ground that Julia needed to socialize with other children. A year passed as Julia went to kindergarten. The girl was taken from the institution alternately by her grandmother and mother. But lately, Leslie noticed that Samanda more and more often asks to take the child to her. And then the pensioner noticed that her daughter was often late at work. She asked Samanda, Why have you been coming late from work lately? We have a lot of reporting to do, and I have to stay late, she said. But you didn't have that before, Leslie said perplexed. Mom, don't forget that times are changing and life is getting more complicated, Samanda said. Two weeks after this conversation, Leslie was walking home with her granddaughter from kindergarten when suddenly Julia shouted. Here comes my mom. The woman looked at the girl, who was pointing with her hand to the sidewalk across the driveway. Indeed, Leslie saw her daughter walking hand in hand with a man. The woman smiled. Now she understood her daughter's delays at work. Only one thing annoyed the mother, that Samanda was hiding her relationship from her. Soon the grandmother and her granddaughter returned home, and Leslie waited impatiently for her daughter. She wanted to talk to her, and as soon as the young woman entered the house, then her mother turned to her with a question. Is it another emergency at work? As always, calmly said the girl, Daughter, and when did you learn to deceive your mother? With a smile said the old woman, What do you mean deceive? Samanda answered with a question. But then Julia intervened in the conversation between the two women and shouted excitedly, Mammy and grandmother, and I saw you, you were walking with your uncle on your arm. I wanted to run to you. But my grandmother did not let me. I was still offended at her then. Leslie looked at Samanda with the same smile. The young woman was confused. She understood her mother's question about cheating perfectly now. Samanda told her mother that she would explain everything a little later. Leslie nodded in response and went to heat up dinner to feed everyone. The conversation between the two women didn't happen until after Julia went to bed. Samanda looked at her mom and informed her that she had a man courting her. Leslie was overjoyed at the news and replied to her daughter that it was high time she had a personal life. Samanda looked thoughtfully at her mom and spoke softly. I don't love that man. Then why are you going out with him? The landlady said perplexed. He gives me money. Didn't you notice that last month I didn't pay Julia for the children's corner in installments? Samanda said. Are you crazy? How can you sell yourself? I already wanted to tell you that you sometimes spoiled Julia with your gifts. I raised you without a cubbyhole. And Julia doesn't really need one. I'm begging you, daughter, to end this relationship. You need to respect and appreciate yourself. Believe me, 
that you will meet your happiness in life, but you shouldn't waste on trifles. Leslie said sadly, who was really shocked by her daughter's message. Mom, the years are flying by and I'm all alone. It seems to me that I will never love anyone. Almost crying, said the girl. Ah, well, stop your nonsense. Why do you write yourself in the old women? Everything will work out for you. But stop selling yourself. God forbid Julia finds out about it, said the old woman sternly. Okay, mom, let's stop talking about this. I promise that I will not meet with this man because I myself from this relationship is disgusting. I just hoped that in time I could love a man. But it did not happen quietly, said the young woman. A few days later, Leslie noticed that her daughter really stopped working late. The older woman sighed with relief. She wanted Samanda to be happy, but not like this. Time moved forward, and Julia went to the first grade. And a month before this event, Samanda went to work at the bank. The woman was happy about this event, as she dreamed of working in a government organization. Samanda was happy with everything in her life, except for one thing, she did not have a man. The woman tried to get together with a young man who was four years younger than her. However, after a month the guy cheated on her, and Samanda broke off the relationship with him without regret. Once the girl returned home, and she received a call from her daughter's class teacher, Selena, who asked her to come to school tomorrow. Samanda asked the teacher what was the matter, but the interlocutor said that it was not a telephone conversation. Samanda came home and went straight to her daughter. Julia, did you do something wrong at school? No, said the girl sullenly. You're lying to me. Quickly answer why I am called to school. The woman said sternly. I don't know said the daughter with a sullen look. Leslie intervened in the conversation and asked Samanda to calm down. The woman turned to her granddaughter and asked her to go to the nursery. As soon as the child came out, the landlady told Samanda, you are not behaving properly towards your daughter. Don't you see that on the one hand you spoil her with things and toys, and on the other hand, you don't even try to communicate with your daughter. You are not a child anymore and you should realize that Julia lacks your attention. She doesn't just need your gifts, she needs companionship. Mom, why don't you tell me how to raise my own daughter? I'll figure it out myself, said the young woman irritably. Well, I will not, but then do not cry if your daughter closes. That's when I will not be able to help you with advice, because you will lose time. Do as you see fit, Leslie said sadly. The woman saw that her daughter had just gone to work and was buying off Julia with gifts so that she wouldn't have to spend time with her. The next morning, Samanda called to work and said that she would be late and then went to school with her daughter. The woman and child walked into Julia's classroom where they were greeted by the classroom teacher. Selena escorted the children out of the classroom and asked the parent if the girl had told her about yesterday's incident. Samanda shook her head negatively. And then the teacher said, Yesterday your daughter at recess cut with scissors the textbooks and notebooks of one of the students. The girl's name is Mallory. You realize that's nonsense, don't you? And what makes you think Julia did it? Samanda said. When Julia did it, a student came into the classroom and witnessed the incident. You need to have a serious talk with your daughter, first of all and you need to apologize to the parents of the girl who was hurt and to the child herself, that's too. And lastly, you are well aware that your girl has committed a misdemeanor, she has damaged someone else's property and you need to compensate for it, said the teacher. I heard you, but it is worth to understand. I am interested in the reason for this act. Maybe my daughter decided to take revenge on Mallory. Julia couldn't just do it without a reason and I'd like to hear it from you," Samanda said discreetly. I think you should ask your daughter. You're her mother, not me, Selena said. Don't poke me in my parental duties. This incident didn't happen at my house. It happened in your classroom when you were in charge of the children. And the first thing you should have done was to ask Julia the reason for it. And I understand that you didn't do it, she said reproachfully. Samanda, I didn't call you here to exchange barbs. I told you about your daughter's behavior, 
And one more thing, I talk to both girls after that, but they don't say anything. I have nothing more to say to you, Selena said. Samanda left the school in a bad mood. She wished that the working day would be over as soon as possible. She wanted to talk to her daughter. Samanda couldn't understand how Julia could do that. She was a kind and sympathetic girl. The workday was over, and the woman walked home with a quick step. In her mind, Samanda went over the options of how she would start a conversation with her daughter. When she got home, she still hadn't figured out where to start the conversation. As soon as Samanda entered the apartment, she asked her mother what Julia had told her after school today. Leslie replied that her granddaughter refused to engage in dialogue at all. Samanda went into her daughter's room and saw that the girl was drawing at the table. The mother turned to the girl. I didn't have time to talk to you at school today, so we'll do it right now. Let me know why you cut your classmates' textbooks and notebooks. Julia continued to draw without reacting to her mother's words. Such ignorant behavior infuriated the woman, and she'd already in raised tones spoke out. I'm not talking to the wall, I'm talking to you. If you have committed a disgusting act, you should be responsible for it. So be reasonable and answer my question. I don't like that, Mallory. She's always bragging about how her parents buy her everything. I got tired of listening to her, so I shut her up. And since her parents are so rich, they'll buy her books and notebooks again, the daughter said coldly. Wait, but it's just monstrous to ruin other people's things for such a stupid reason. Can you imagine that someone else doesn't like you either, and they will do the same to you? You embarrass me in front of that girl's parents. Listen to me. I have co-workers at work that I don't like, but I don't break their laptops or anything. Let's agree so before you want to create a deed, then initially you will turn either to me or to the grandmother and will not make decisions on your own. I'll have to spend some money on your classmate because of your stupid act, and you also promise me right now that tomorrow you will apologize to this Mallory, said the mother of the daughter. Okay. The girl mumbled. Samanda went out into the hall, where she saw her mother, who had perfectly heard the whole short conversation between her daughter and Julia. Leslie came up to Samanda and said that she was good, as she found the right words for the child. The girl thanked her mother for the praise, and then wondered if maybe she was actually not giving her child enough time. From that day on, the woman decided that now she would try to talk to her daughter as often as possible. Several years passed, during this period, Samanda had another affair with a man, which lasted no more than six months. At first the woman was happy with this man, but then, as it turned out, the man was a gambler. Initially, the girl did not pay attention that the chosen one was spending money in the casino, but when he began to demand finances from her, she immediately pointed the man at the door. When Julia was in the seventh grade, then Leslie fell ill. The elderly woman was admitted to the hospital. As it turned out, she had a heart attack. Samanda at that point in time was torn between work, going to the hospital, and household duties. The woman felt that at this rate, she would soon be exhausted, both mentally and physically. Samanda turned to her daughter for help. Julia, you're not a little kid anymore. You can see that mom is exhausted. I have to gallop home from work to prepare food for my grandmother and bring it to her. The food at the hospital is disgusting, and then I have to wash the dishes and eat and other duties. Let you help me with the household chores, you should have done it long ago, but your grandmother always felt sorry for you. Mom, but you are so interesting, and when will I go out then? Julia asked unhappily. You have to know how to allocate your time. In general, your duties include washing the dishes, walking the dog. And in general, the dog was taken at your whim, and grandmother or I had to take care of it. From now on we're changing our life a little bit. You won't lies around anymore, said Samanda. Why don't you ask my opinion? Don't I have a say? Grandmother, if she were here now, would definitely take my side, said Julia. So stop bickering with your mother. You will do as I say, said the woman. 
The next day, Samantha came home from work to find her daughter gone and a dirty plate in the sink. The woman frowned because when she left for work, she never left dirty dishes behind. That meant that Julia had come from school, eaten, and hadn't cleaned her plate after her. Samanda entered her daughter's room and saw that the child was also ignoring the fact that she had asked to put things in the closet from the morning. Samanda followed into the kitchen to boil her mother some dumplings to take to the hospital. The woman mentally scolded her daughter as she cooked and thought of ways to punish her. So Samanda was already sitting in Leslie's room and talking to her. The older woman was asking about her granddaughter and how she was doing. Samanda wanted to tell her mother that Julia was completely out of control, but restrained herself because her mother should not be worried. In the evening of the same day, Samanda sat on the couch and waited for her daughter to return. As soon as Julia entered, the woman said in an icy tone, I understand that I am not your boss and you completely ignore my words. Well, we'll do the same to you. I won't give you money for small expenses. If you want to eat at school, bring your own food, which you'll make yourself. Mom, I just forgot what I have to do. No more packed lunches. That's so last century. Tomorrow, I'll do everything. You'll see. Just give me the money, said Julia capriciously. All right, let it be your way. Tomorrow, I'll give you the money, said her mother. For the first three days after this conversation, Julia fulfilled her mother's duties, but then she started to ignore her mother's tasks again. Samanda did not bother her daughter anymore, but simply left Julia no money. And on the same day, the daughter resentfully told her mother that she would tell her grandmother everything. Samanda wanted to yell at the child, but stopped herself in time and said, just dare to do it. The grandmother must not worry at all. You have to realize that any anxiety could give her another heart attack. So if you want to get money, you must do your chores like a diligent child. Julia sullenly remained silent in response and only asked her mother when her grandmother would be discharged. Samanda replied that it would be in a couple of days. As soon as Julia heard this, she breathed a sigh of relief. The girl decided that it would be okay to wait a few days, and then Grandma would take care of the household chores. So Leslie was discharged, and as before, the old woman took on her shoulders the housework. This fact did not escape Samanda's gaze, and she decided to talk to her mother. Mom, you indulge Julia in everything, and you can't do that. She doesn't do anything around the house. Julia is not a five-year-old child anymore, and she should help us too. I'm asking you not to do her chores for her. She'll have to do housework when she gets married, and now let her rest for the time being. Especially I have plenty of time, at least I will be useful in something, said the old woman. You're wrong, mom. Yes, realize that Julia will grow up selfish. You yourself once scolded me for spoiling her with gifts and things, and now you do the same thing. When I don't give her money for unfulfilled work, you give her money secretly from me. Samanda said tiredly. Don't be angry, I will do as you say, said the old woman with a smile. Leslie died when Julia was in 11th grade. Samanda and her daughter were taking the loss of their loved one hard. The elderly woman was buried next to the grave of her late spouse. Samanda during the burial said to herself, here you are mom and reunited with your loved one in heaven. After Leslie's passing, Samanda went through a difficult time in her life. Her late mother had previously helped her with finances from her pension, but now there was no place to wait for help, and Julia started asking for more and more money for daily expenses. Samanda tried to explain to the girl that she needed to reduce her requests a little. A month after the funeral, she received a phone call from Victoria, her class teacher, who immediately said, I'd like to see you tomorrow at school. I'd like to see you at school tomorrow. It's about your daughter's behavior. What's wrong? Samanda asked excitedly. It's a long story and not over the phone. If you have some free time at the moment, you can come to the school. I'll be here later today anyway, said the teacher. 
I'll be at your place within the hour, Samanda said. The woman excused herself from work, then called a cab and drove to the school. On the way, she tried to call her daughter, but her phone was disconnected. Samanda felt that she was called for a reason and was very worried that her daughter had made a serious mess in the educational institution. And the woman was not mistaken in her speculations, as the teacher immediately said to Samanda when she met her. I know that you've had a grief recently. I'm sorry for your loss, but I have some more unpleasant news to tell you. It's that today your daughter went through students' pockets in the locker room. The girl was caught red-handed by our cleaning lady. But this is not an isolated incident. The same incident happened a couple weeks ago. Julia was seen doing it by our counsellor. We talked to your girl, and she promised it wouldn't happen again. I didn't tell you at that time, because I realised that you had just recently buried your mother, and it was very hard for you. Plus, I believe Julia that she wouldn't do it again. But, you see, it happened again. Now, I have to report this episode to our principal, but I don't want to do that. I want to help your daughter, but I can't do it without your help. Julia is going through puberty, and she could go down the wrong path, especially with a friend like Sarah. Wait a minute. Sarah, who's two years older than Julia, but she is a decent girl. Her mother is still very sick, and she needed money for the operation, said Samanda quietly, who was stunned by the message of the class teacher. Yes, I'm talking about this Sarah, only she was expelled from school for systematic truancy. She lives with her mother near me, and I see your daughter around Sarah a lot. But only this girl and her mother are in good health, except for the fact that the woman is a fan of strong drinks, said Victoria, and after a short pause continued. And now you and I have to decide what to do next. Just understand now, she has already been caught twice by two people who work at the school. They will not spread it out what happened. But the thing is that the parents of the students have already raised the issue at the meeting about the fact that from the pockets of their children are missing some values. And you realize the school's reputation is being damaged by that. And now imagine that Julia will be caught by a person who will not keep silent. It is not necessary to explain the situation further. So tell me how we will act, said the teacher. Why do children leave valuables in their pockets? Samanda asked a question and immediately scolded herself mentally for it. Victoria looked at her parent with a puzzled look when she heard the question. Samanda understood the look of the class teacher without words and immediately said, I'm sorry, I'm just dizzy from what I've just learned. I can say from my side that I will talk to my daughter today. You see, I'm in a trance at the moment because I don't know what to do. I give my daughter money for small expenses, but within reasonable limits. But her demands are getting bigger and bigger every day. Maybe you can advise me something. Victoria looked at the visitor and said, Let's do this. I will also talk to your daughter, as you did. And also, if you are advised, try to convince Julia to stop communicating with Sarah. And maybe a psychologist can help you have a professional talk to the girl. Our school psychologist has already talked to Julia, but you see, our employee is very young, only the first year after college, and she has little experience yet. And you need someone with experience. Thank you so much. I don't know how to thank you. Samanda almost cried. The woman went home after school in a gloomy mood. She realized that simple persuasion would not help to set Julia on the right path. Samanda was at a loss as to how to influence her daughter to stop stealing and befriending Sarah, about whom there was a bad rumor. With these sad thoughts, the woman came home, and to her surprise, Julia was already there. The mother looked at her daughter with a testing look. The girl calmly endured the gaze and first asked a question. What has the class already told you fables about me? Stop sarcasm. Let's talk like adults. You're behaving in an unacceptable way. You lied to me and grandma last year about the money you stole for the operation. Don't tell me that's what happened. I can tell you that I've heard about Sarah's mom. Daughter, realize that you're not only embarrassing yourself, you're embarrassing me. 
I was ashamed of what you did today. Today, you steal from school children, and tomorrow you'll go robbing stores? How can you not realize that this isn't going to end well? You need to get smart. You're not a stupid girl, so why do I have to spell it out for you? You think I'd enjoy giving you these moralizing lectures? I can answer that I don't like it at all. Now tell me something in return, said the woman, almost crying. I have nothing to say to you. I've already made it clear to you once that I lacked from you, but you didn't hear me, and now I don't want to tell you anything. And don't touch Sarah, she's a great girl and friend, said the girl to her mother. It seems to me that we speak different languages. I have a suggestion for you. Let me sign you up to a psychologist. You go to sessions with a specialist for a while. If you want, we'll go together, Samanda said. I'm not sick enough to go to a psychologist. Can I take it that we've reached the end of our educational conversation? Julia asked quietly. Do you promise me that you won't steal? Said her mother tiredly. Okay, Julia answered. After talking to her daughter, Samanda went to the bathroom, where the door was locked. It was only then that she let the tears flow. She tried to cry quietly so her daughter wouldn't hear. The woman didn't know at the moment if today's conversation had affected Julia's consciousness, and somewhere, with a woman's instinct, Samanda realized that the whole conversation was useless for her daughter, and at the same time it dawned on her that tears would not help her, and she should talk to Sarah and insist that she stop talking to Julia. Samanda fulfilled her plan the next day. She got the address of her daughter's friend from Victoria, and soon she met Sarah. The woman looked at the girl with a critical eye, noting that she looked like a vulgar person with bright makeup. Samanda forced herself not to give her daughter's friend a barbed remark about her appearance. Samanda said a friendly hello and introduced herself as Julia's mother. Sarah looked at the visitor with disdain and said, What do you want from me? What do you want from me? I have an unusual favor to ask of you. I'd like you to stop talking to Julia. You see, I don't mind you in general, but your friendship is having a negative effect on my daughter's behavior. I realize I may be saying things that are probably unpleasant for you. I don't know how to convince you that you shouldn't be friends with Julia. Just put yourself in my shoes. I think you two would only want your daughter to be happy. If this is offensive to you, I can suggest another option. Change your lifestyle for the better, said Samanda in a steady voice. Will you give me money to stop being friends with Julia? The girl said defiantly. You see how you talk to a woman who is old enough to be your mother. You address me as you without any preamble, and I address you as you, by the way. And now tell me, what can Julia learn from your intercourse? The woman spoke more sternly. I've had enough of school morals, so go on your way. Let Julia decide who she wants to socialize with. And now goodbye. And with these words, Sarah closed the front door in front of the uninvited guest. Samanda walked out of the entryway in a disgusted mood. The woman, when she went to the girl, thought that the conversation could still work. But now, after a couple of minutes of communication with Sarah, she realized that her daughter had befriended a boorish person who did not care about anyone from a high bell tower. When she got home, Samanda called out to Julia, but she wasn't home. The woman looked into her daughter's room and found it a mess, and she had asked Julia to clean it up from the night before. Samanda felt her anger towards her daughter boiling up inside her, and she only wanted to call Julia when the girl came home. The woman promptly jumped up to her daughter and was about to say everything as Julia shouted angrily. Who asked you to go to Sarah's? I will now disregard your opinion too. How you treat me is how I treat you. How do you talk to your mother? Samanda, who had never heard such a tone from her daughter before, was stunned. Oh, what did you want? You think you're such a goody-goody in life. I know everything about you, how you gave birth to me from who knows who, and then slept with a man for money. And with your work, you completely forgot about me, about your life said the girl angrily, and then quickly skipped to her room, and in a few minutes returned to her mother with a puffy notebook, which she handed to Samanda with the words. 
here you go and enjoy reading. It was Grandma who kept a diary and wrote down everything that happened to her daughter, which is you. It was interesting to read about you. I wasn't going to say anything to you. I kept it all to myself. But you crossed the line when you went to ask Sarah to stop talking to me and even offered her money for it. Samantha was in a daze after her daughter's statement and only said, I did not offer Sarah money, but asked her to stop the friendship or change her attitude to life. After these words, the woman took the notebook from her daughter's hands and suddenly cried at the same moment. Samanda could not believe that all of what she had said had been said by her daughter. And Julia looked at her mother and grinned floatingly and then ran out of the apartment. The girl was glad that she had finally found the strength to tell her mother everything. She was also helped by Sarah, who had said a lot of unpleasant things about her mother after the meeting with Samanda. It had been a couple of hours since Julia had had a fight with her mom and left the house. Samanda, who had already cried during this time, couldn't find a place for herself from worrying about her daughter. She repeatedly called Julia, but she didn't pick up the phone. The woman was out of her mind with worry. She also wondered why her mother kept this diary in which she described the events that concerned her daughter. Samanda only read a few entries in the notebook and realized that Julia was telling the truth because the diary contained this information in Leslie's handwriting. When the clock showed 10 o'clock in the evening, Samanda was in a panic as she didn't know where to look for her daughter. The woman quickly gathered herself and went to Sarah's house, but there she was opened by an elderly lady in an inebriated state who informed her that Sarah was not at home and she would return at an unknown time. Samanda stepped out of the entryway and had just taken a step when she slipped and fell. She tried to get up but felt unable to stand on her foot as she was pierced by a sharp pain in her ankle. The woman cried involuntarily and thought that today was completely filled with sorrowful events. Samanda tried to get up again, but as in the first case, she sank to the ground, which was covered with a crust of ice. A man who was walking his dog came to her aid. The stranger helped the woman to stand up while saying, How are you so not careful? I have a car, I will now take you to the hospital, although I can assume that you have either a crack or a fracture of the ankle. Are you a doctor to gig out diagnosis at a glance? Said the woman, almost crying. I'm a paramedic and my name is Byron, said the man smiling. I see, said Samanda, and tried to step on her sore foot, and then she cried out in pain. No, this will not do, said the man and picked up the woman in his arms. Samanda wanted to be indignant at the stranger's prank, but she immediately stopped as she realized that she could not manage without help. Meanwhile, the stranger gently held the victim in his arms and walked towards his car, which was parked not far away. As soon as the man approached the car, he lowered Samanda gently onto the snow-covered ground with the words, Let's get in the car and I'll take you to the hospital. After that Byron helped the woman into the car in the front seat and then opened the back door and commanded the dog to jump in. Only then did he get behind the wheel himself. Along the way, Samanda gave her name and told him in a nutshell that she was looking for her daughter. The man drove the woman to the hospital then made a call and two paramedics came out with a stretcher. Before Samanda was to be carried away, Byron asked her a question. You are likely to be offered hospitalization. Do you intend to stay in the hospital? Absolutely not. I still have to find my daughter. You know that, Samanda said. Then I'll wait for you and we'll solve your problem together. Don't contradict me, the man said and signaled the orderlies to carry the woman. A short time later, Byron met Samanda, who had a cast on her leg. The man took Samanda in his arms again, without any authorization, and carried her to his car. And when he got behind the wheel, he said, Dictate your daughter's number. I'll call you from my phone. Maybe Julia doesn't pick up when you call on purpose. Let's say she wants you to worry more. And she doesn't know my number, so she might pick up. Samanda dictated the numbers and watched with excitement as the new acquaintance dialed Julia's number. 
The girl answered immediately, and the man told her that her mom had a cast on and needed help. Julia anxiously asked where the mother was at the moment, and at the same moment Byron handed the phone to Samanda. The woman turned to her daughter excitedly. Where are you? I've been worried sick about you. I'm at a friend's house. Don't worry about me. I will come in the morning, said the girl and immediately disconnected the connection. Samanda wanted to reprimand her daughter, but the conversation was cut off by Julia herself. The woman looked at the phone, clutched in her hand, and suddenly burst into tears. Byron was confused and did not know how to calm the passenger. A few minutes passed before the man spoke. You need to stop crying, your tears won't help anything anyway. Let me take you home and if you don't mind, I'll stay with you. What about your family? Your relatives will be worried about you, said the woman without stopping crying. The only family I have is my pug, who sleeps in the back seat. By the way, if you let me in, I will go only with my faithful friend. You know I can't leave him here, said the man. Thank you for everything, and I agree to accept you too at this late hour, said the woman. Soon the couple was sitting in Samanda's living room. The woman herself, without knowing why, was telling about her life to the man she had met only a couple of hours ago. The man listened attentively to the interlocutor, and with every moment, he realized that he liked the landlady more and more. After a while, Samanda came to her senses and looked at her watch with an alarmed ouch. She apologized to her guest and wondered if she was holding him up. Byron laughed in response and said that he was glad for the delay because he was a guest of the most beautiful woman in the world. Samanda was embarrassed and said, don't make me blush. Don't make me blush like a schoolgirl. You're right about the naughty part. You really are a naughty girl, the man said seriously. Are we already on a first name basis? Samanda said, puzzled. The man was silent in response. He only stared at the woman. The landlady felt naked under this gaze, so she couldn't stand it and asked, you said that I had done something wrong and in more way. You made the lonely heart of the paramedic beat much stronger, quietly said the man. I understand you. You want to tell me that I am a woman of easy behavior because I let a strange man in at night. And now you have decided that with beautiful words, you can put me in bed for pleasure. Did I understand everything correct? Hostile note. So understand correctly that I am not your enemy, but your friend. Your mom's being counseled at the moment. And who told you that I'm going to communicate with you? The girl said pompously. And you have no other way out because I'm taking over your mother's patronage and at the same time, and you. Someone has to cover your night out, Byron said with a smile. Julia grinned and went to her room. Samanda wanted to yell at the guest, but the man gestured for the landlady to be quiet, and then the guest muttered that it was useless to scold her daughter now. The woman looked perplexed at the interlocutor, and he in turn said that now it was necessary to communicate more with Julia. Samanda flared up after these words and asked the man to leave the apartment. Byron, with a smile, took the replica of the woman he liked and said that he would visit Samanda in the near future. As soon as the guest left, Samanda called her daughter and lectured her for a long time on raised tones, and the girl looked indifferently at her mother. The woman felt that everything she said for Julia was parallel. At last, Samanda said, if there is one remark from the school, then believe me, I will find a way to punish you. I can also tell you that there are special boarding schools for troubled teenagers, so I could overcome myself and send you there, so that they can teach you some sense. I know what you mean. There is a fiancé, then from the daughter must get rid of, mockingly said Julia and closing the door to her room through her mother. Good idea, go ahead. Samanda clenched her fists powerlessly. She wanted to spank her daughter on her soft spot, but she realized that this method of upbringing was no longer suitable. The woman lay down. She tried to calm down, but it was not possible. Samanda fell asleep only in the morning. When the woman woke up, her daughter was already gone. Samanda looked at the clock. At this moment, Julia should have a break, and she decided to call Julia. 
but the girl dropped the call. And just a few minutes later, Samanda received a call from the class teacher informing her that Julia had stolen a cell phone from a junior high school student and there were witnesses to the act. Samanda was stunned by this news. She told the teacher that she couldn't come to school. Victoria pronounced that she knew about the broken ankle. The teacher also said that the theft case would not be considered at the pedagogical council and Julia would be registered at the children's police station. After the conversation, Samanda sat down and cried. She did not know how to get in touch with her daughter. The woman was lost in guessing in what period of time she had missed the upbringing of her child, and Samanda called an anonymous center of psychological help out of desperation. Who are you to tell me what I do or don't do? I see you for the second time in my life to listen to your reproaches. So we'll see each other every day from now on. What's the problem? I'm moving here to live with you, said the guest with a smile. What kind of impudent statement is that? The woman said in confusion. We're adults. If you didn't like me, you would have told me to get out right away, but you didn't. But if you want me to hit on you for a couple of weeks, I'll do it. But realize how much precious time we'll lose, the man said. You're really crazy. Get out and never come to me again, exclaimed the woman and at the same moment was silent as Byron embraced her and kissed her passionately on the lips. And then the man left, leaving a note with his phone number on the nightstand. The woman pressed her palm to her lips after Byron left and smiled involuntarily. At that moment, she wished the man had left, as she wished the man had continued to kiss her. Samanda picked up the piece of paper and twirled it thoughtfully before her eyes. Two weeks had passed since Byron had left, and the man had not made himself known. The woman thought about him often and found herself wishing she could see him every day. The relationship with her daughter was strained. Julia tried not to talk to her mother too much. Soon Samanda's cast was removed, and she was on her way home from the hospital when the phone rang. It was the class teacher calling. Samanda immediately tensed up internally, and not in vain, as the teacher informed her that Julia had fought with a classmate and broken her index finger. The parents of the victim are going to file a petition in court against Julia's mother, who negligently brings up her daughter, since the child behaves like that. Victoria advised Samanda to go to the girl and try to settle the conflict. Samanda thanked the educator for the call and disconnected the connection. The woman took a cab and went to the victim's house. Samanda immediately asked for herself and her daughter to apologize to the girl and her parents. And then the woman said, I realize that my daughter has committed a terrible act and it is impossible to turn a blind eye to it. But I have a compelling request to you not to file an application to the court. Let me give you some money in the form of compensation for moral harm. Understand me correctly, I do not want publicity in this case. The parents of the victim named the amount they would like to have and asked Samanda to talk strictly with her daughter, as they will not tolerate such behavior for the second time. The woman tearfully promised that she would talk to Julia today, after which she once again thanked the owners of the apartment for everything. Samanda returned home in a depressed state. Her way passed through the apartment building, where a friend of her daughter lived. The woman looked gloomily at the entrance, where Sarah lived. She blamed her daughter's friend for all her troubles. Samanda mentally imagined how she would like to reprimand the girl now. The woman was so engrossed in her thoughts that she didn't immediately hear someone calling her name. Samanda turned to the side and saw Byron, who was walking with a dog, the man approached her and said, I see you are in a foul mood again. I wish I could admire your smile and never see you cry. You know, and I'm so glad to see you, but you disappeared and never gave any news about yourself, said the woman sadly. You had my phone number and you could have called me at any time of the day or night and I would have come right away. I have a proposition for you. Let's go to my place. I'm having a little party tonight, and I don't want to celebrate alone, Byron said. What kind of celebration? The woman asked quietly. 
It was to celebrate a paramedic's length of service. I've been a paramedic for 20 years, he said with a smile. Wow, such an event is not a sin to celebrate, but I don't have a present, Samantha said. For me, the gift is you. Now let's go to my place, said the man cheerfully. And now the couple sat in Byron's one-room apartment. The man put in front of the guest a vase with sweets, as well as a small purchase cake and poured tea. They were sitting and talking peacefully when Samanda suddenly asked, I don't understand one thing. Why do you live without a soulmate? After all, you are handsome, not old, tactful in communication. I was married and have a grown-up son who went abroad to live with my wife divorced more than eight years ago. At one time I loved her very much, and she cheated on me. Then I took offense at the whole world and gave myself completely to work, excluding from his life of the fair sex, but up to a certain point. And you know what it was, said the landlord quietly. I don't know, said the woman, who guessed perfectly well what her interlocutor was talking about. And at the same moment Byron stood up, approached the guest, and then bent down and said in a hoarse voice, Then I'll remind you now. And with these words he kissed Samanda. And then there were hot kisses, passionate embraces. It was not until some time later that they broke away from each other. Samanda lay on her lover's shoulder and stroked the man's cheek with the palm of her hand. Byron looked at the woman and spoke, I feel very good with you. I even then, when you fell unsuccessfully lifted in my arms, I realize that I want to carry you like this all the time. And you offer it to me, and you will know my answer. The woman said with a smile. Let's never be apart again, Byron said. I'd love to, but you know how much trouble I'm having with my daughter. Julia would blame me if we got back together. I paid a lot of money today to get this phone thing out of the way. Sometimes I think she does it on purpose to make me mad, she said sadly. I'll take care of Julia but you have to change a lot of things about her too. You need to realize that Julia is a person and not your property. Now, let's get ready and go to your place. I'll go to work from your apartment tomorrow morning and Julia has to have a cake for my birthday. By the way, how does your daughter feel about dogs? The man said, you'll have to ask her about that because we had a dog for Julia, but she didn't want to take care of it. So I gave the dog to good hands later. Samanda said and added, I'm so scared. I mean about bringing a man to our house for the night. You're talking nonsense. You're not bringing a man to sleep over. You're bringing a man you love to live with you. That's the right way to put it. Byron said softly and kissed his beloved. So the couple was sitting in Samanda's apartment talking. The woman was visibly nervous and glanced at her watch. Byron saw all this and asked his beloved not to worry. Samanda nodded nervously in response, but continued to worry. And then the front door opened and Julia, who didn't know that her mother wasn't alone in the apartment, came in. The girl from the threshold shouted, Mom, I tell you at once that you do not read me lectures about stealing, or else otherwise I will leave the house. The sweet child came home, and we are waiting for you to drink tea and celebrate my holiday. And by the way, I'm not going to lecture you. I'm just going to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with you, Byron said. The girl entered the hall and looked at the man perplexed, and then she looked at her mother, who was sitting with her eyes down to the floor. Julia then turned to the man. Let's have a conversation, but I will also tell you that if I don't like it, I will leave here immediately. Byron smiled and said that he wanted to talk to the girl alone. Julia at first wanted to resent the suggestion, but then changed her mind and waved her hand toward her room. The couple secluded themselves. The man, as soon as they were alone, spoke. Let's do the following. First, I will live from this day with you. Second, I and your mom will soon become husband and wife. And this means that I love your mom and will not give her in offense. Thirdly, from this day forward, you will stop stealing and generally behaving inappropriately. I, for my part, pledge to treat you with understanding and respect. And in doing so, I'd also want to be your friend. How's that sound? Isn't that a lot to take on, uncle? 
When you pay, then we'll talk. Julia said with a smear and then added, you have to pay for pleasure. And if you want to sleep with my mom, you have to shut your stepdaughter's mouth with bills. You sound like a local thug, but I can live with that. We'll agree on finances, but you stick to my three points, how to behave. Said the man and just wanted to leave as he turned and added, and you should not call me uncle. It sounds vulgar from your lips, but Byron and address me on you will be just right. By the way, I came here with my dog. His name is Walter. He loves to be petted. Byron left Julia's room and walked towards Samanda, who was staring at him questioningly. The man stroked the woman's hand and pronounced that Julia knew about everything and that she would change from this day forward. Samanda looked at her lover incredulously, and he only winked at her in response. The next day, Byron left for work early in the morning and kissed his lover before leaving. Only behind the man closed the front door as Julia ran up to her mother and asked when she had time to seduce this paramedic. Samanda cringed at her daughter's words like a toothache and asked Julia to choose her words. Julia only laughed mockingly in response. A couple of days later, Samanda and her lover filed an application in the registry office. The woman was happy because next to her was her favorite person and her daughter became more malleable. However, the ideal in the family did not last long. Already after Byron and Samanda signed, then Julia declared herself. The girl began to demand more and more money from her mother's husband. The man gave it first within reasonable limits, but then her appetite for finances increased and he told her that he would receive pocket money every day, but in smaller amounts. Julia's reaction to this announcement was lightning fast. She didn't come home for the night. Samanda roared all night, and when her daughter showed up in the morning, gave her a huge scandal. She slapped her in the face. Julia only laughed in response, and then suggested that the mother to talk about this topic with her husband. A few years later, Julia finished 11 grades, during this time, Samanda and her husband repeatedly blushed for the girl's actions at pedagogical councils on the Commission on Juvenile Affairs, as well as in front of the parents of the affected students. Samanda repeatedly tried to talk to her daughter to educate her. Often the woman did not hold back and went to shouting during explanatory conversations. Byron at such times tried to pacify his beloved and not to shout at Julia. The man wanted the ghoul to express why she behaves like this, but the stepdaughter refused to contact him in a friendly way. And so the day before her 18th birthday, the girl appealed to her stepfather with a request that he give a round sum of money. The man asked what exactly, and Julia voiced the figure. Byron, having heard with surprise, whistled and said, Your appetite, dear lady, has grown by leaps and bounds. May I ask what kind of business you need so much money for? After all, on this amount you can live at least a couple of months without needing anything. Do you care? It's my birthday, and I want to celebrate it in a big way, after all. Not every day you celebrate such a date, said the girl. But I don't have that much money. I could offer you only a third. I understand that it's your birthday, but you have to balance your income and expenses, the man said. Julia snorted in response and waited for her mother to come home from work to talk about it. As soon as Tamanda came and recognized her daughter's request, she immediately gave a negative answer as she did not have such finances. A scandal broke out between the mother and Julia, and Julia first called her mother a foul word and slapped her on the cheek, and then locked herself in her room. Samanda, who had not expected this turn of events, sat in the hall crying. In such a state, the woman was caught by her husband, who wake out during the conversation on business. He hugged his beloved and asked about the reason for the tears. Byron frowned, because Julia had never allowed herself to raise a hand on her mother before. He went to his stepdaughter's room and knocked on the door. The girl replied that she had no desire to talk to any of the household. The next day, Samanda got up and saw that her daughter was no longer at home. The woman was surprised at this, 
as Julia had been sleeping practically until lunchtime lately after school, and here she was gone. Samanda walked into the room and noted, as always, that her daughter had left a mess in the room and then noticed a white sheet taped to the dresser. She walked over and read the message, which was written in Julia's hand, you will regret everything. Samanda shuddered to think what else Julia might do. The woman went into the living room and suddenly noticed that one door of the sideboard was not closed. Puzzled, she walked over and opened the door wider and immediately noticed that the jewelry box was ajar. Samanda took the box in her hands and found that the black gold cross that Byron had given her was missing. It was a piece of jewelry he had inherited from his grandmother. She then asked him why he had not given the cross to his first wife, and he jokingly replied that he was saving the jewelry for her, and now the jewel was gone. The woman sank powerlessly to the floor. She realized that her daughter had taken the cross in revenge for her not giving her the money. Samanda did not know how to tell her husband about it now when he woke up, but it was necessary to speak. The woman tried to call her daughter, but the caller was out of range. Samanda dialed and dialed Julia, and soon Byron woke up and saw his wife sitting on the floor. He walked over to his wife and said affectionately, Why are you sitting here all alone? I don't know how to tell you about it. My daughter stole from us. And with these words, the woman sobbed. What are you talking about? Said the head of the family in bewilderment. Julia has taken the cross and is not answering the phone. Samanda said through her tears, Oh, that's what it is. Stop crying. Let's hope that the money from selling the jewelry will be enough for her and she won't do something stupid. You know very well that you would have inherited this cross to your daughter in the future anyway. Just consider that you did it in advance, the man said to his wife and hugged her tenderly. Byron understood that now his wife felt guilty about her daughter's deed and he didn't want her to feel guilty for something she hadn't done. Julia hadn't been home for two days. Samanda was tormented by the thought that something bad had happened to her daughter. She tried not to let her husband see her tears, but Byron saw the red eyes of his wife and understood the reason for it. He supported her as best he could, trying to cheer her up. And on the third day, Samanda received a call from the police informing her that her daughter had been arrested for robbing a store and was detained on a hot trail. The woman was at home at that moment and only heard the news and sat down quietly on a chair. She couldn't believe what the stranger had just said on the phone. Samanda would have been happy to cry, but there were no tears at all. She felt a kind of numbness. Soon her husband came home from work and saw the detached look in her eyes. Byron asked the woman worriedly, What happened, my love? Samanda looked at her husband and spoke quietly. The police called and said that Julia robbed the store. What will happen now? Will she go to jail? How could something like that happen? What should we do? The man looked at his wife dumbfounded. He had not expected such news and was at a loss. It took a few minutes before Byron could gather his thoughts and tell his wife to calm down. The head of the family thought about what they could do in this situation. But looking at the time, he realized that at the beginning of the ninth night, they would not be able to solve any problems. He hugged his wife and quietly said, let me give you a sedative now and you go to bed. Understand, my dear, that now we are not able to do anything. It is necessary to wait for the morning and only then to act. But to be honest, I do not know what to do. I promise we'll do something anyway. The next day, Byron and his wife went to the police, where they learned all the details from the investigator. Samanda asked the man in uniform to let her daughter go free, and as if in a trance, repeated that she was ready to give a lot of money for it. The investigator saw that the woman was in a state of effect and advised Byron to take his wife home. A couple days passed and Samanda learned that she and her spouse could do nothing to help Julia. The investigator was only able to authorize a visit with Julia. Samanda cried tears and told her daughter, What have you done? You've ruined your life. It's too late for tears, mom. 
You couldn't get your only child out of jail, then disappear from my life forever. I don't want to see you, she said in a mocking tone. After these words of her daughter, Samanda silently stood up and then looked sadly at Julia and said, as you say, my dear, I will not trouble you anymore. So there was a trial, which was attended only by Byron, and Samanda flatly refused to be present at the sentencing. The girl was given four years in prison. Julia's mother learned about this from her husband. The woman silently listened to her husband and did not say anything in response. Byron at that time thought that the wife was in shock, so such an indifferent reaction to the sentence. However, time passed and Samanda completely refused to talk to her husband about her daughter. Byron tried to dissolve his beloved, saying that it is necessary July to write to the prison and support the girl behind the barbed wire. But in response, the husband heard only one thing. Stop reminding me of her. I'm honoring her request. Let's please don't talk about this topic as I don't want to. Just don't rub it in my face. It's been a year since Julia was sent to prison. Samanda had steadfastly refused to talk about her daughter all that time, and Byron had stopped bothering his wife with reminders of Julia. He did not want to cause her mental anguish, as he saw that as soon as they started talking about Julia, Samanda became nervous and he had to give her a sedative. However, Samanda did not understand in the past year why her husband had two business trips for professional development and she suspected her husband of adultery. And it also became a reason that Byron started taking extra shifts at night. Samanda couldn't take it anymore and asked him point blank, did you get another woman on the side? What makes you say that? What kind of nonsense are you talking about? Can you even explain why you made such conclusions? bewildered husband asked, I'm not a stupid woman, and your night duty, which you are constantly taking, I have certain thoughts. You do not find it a significant evidence in your cheating, said the spouse. Are you crazy? Honey, I don't need anyone but you. Why are you talking nonsense? Yes, damn, I'm trying to earn money on purpose, so that we with you to go to the sea to relax, and you're making up such a thing here, said the husband. The woman after these words sighed with relief. She was actually afraid that her lover has taken a mistress on the side. And when the man said that he was saving money for a trip to the sea, she was relieved. Several years passed and Samanda asked her spouse about the fact that he still takes extra shifts and they still have not gone anywhere on vacation. The man hugged his chosen one in response and pronounced that the trip was canceled due to his illness. The wife only heard about the indisposition of the chosen one, as immediately became alarmed. She immediately asked a bunch of questions to her husband. However, the man stopped the eloquent flow of the chosen one and said, Why are you so worried? A simple ailment and do not need to now so immediately think about the bad. Give me time and everything will be normal. I just need to lie down in the hospital and improve my health. Wait. Are you suspecting me of adultery again? Oh, you naughty girl. Tell me the truth about yourself. I beg you. With tears in her eyes, said the woman, who was afraid of losing her loved one. And in response, she heard Byron's words. My darling, I'm all right. You do not worry, but I have a serious conversation with you. I know you don't want to talk about your daughter because you're in a shell, but it's time to crawl out of it. Realize that Julia is your own child and has made mistakes in her life, and more than one. But she needs to be given a chance. You have to meet her. That's out of the question. Do you want us to have a big fight? I don't feel like it, Samanda said dryly. Well, my dear, we will not talk about it today. Byron said humbly, he hoped to have a conversation with his wife about her daughter. The man was disappointed that his wife was once again taking the conversation on the subject in stride. He knew he didn't have much time left to reconcile mother and daughter. A little over two months after that conversation, Byron passed away from brain cancer. This was a big blow to Samanda, as her husband was well aware of his illness and had kept it from her. She learned about it from her husband's colleagues, 
who reported that her husband asked her not to inform her about the disease in any case, as he was worried about her condition. This circumstance most of all rubbed her soul, because the loved one knew that he was dying and worried about her. When the funeral took place, Samanda sobbed in despair. The woman could not believe that now she was left alone, without her loved one. She watched the coffin being lowered into the pit and wanted only one thing at that moment, to be near her husband. After the funeral, a couple of days passed and the woman, having visited the grave, came home as suddenly felt that there was someone in the apartment. She herself did not know where this premonition came from. She went through the rooms, but there were no traces. Samanda so scolded herself mentally for being suspicious. However, the feeling that someone had been in the apartment did not let go and the woman decided to check the spare keys to the apartment, which she and her husband kept in the chest of drawers. And then Samanda noticed that they were missing. The woman was well aware that the deceased husband, if he had taken a duplicate, would have informed her about it. Samanda was terrified because the keys couldn't just disappear. So someone had stolen them. The woman immediately wondered who had done it and why, because she and her late husband, if they had a small savings, it was on a card. She immediately decided to change the lock in the apartment. And the very next day, when she got to work, she took the day off. The woman hurried home, as she had already contacted a specialist who was to change her lock that day. When Samanda approached the door of her apartment, she noticed that the doormat was lying crooked. This alerted the woman and she carefully opened the front door. Samanda entered the apartment and suddenly froze with horror as she saw her own daughter rummaging through her things. All the woman could manage to say was, Julia, and with these words she lost consciousness. Samanda woke up some time later. Her daughter was sitting beside her, her eyes reddened with tears. Julia quietly said, I'm sorry, Mom, but we need to talk. Are you able to do that now or should I call for an ambulance? Date, how did you get here? Barely audible mother said, I have a lot to tell you but please let me speak, Julia said. I'm listening to you, Samanda said, still not understanding what was happening. Mom, I'm very sorry to you, but it's not about that now. Your husband was a wonderful man, and I'm ashamed that I treated you and him like a pig. After I sent you away, but you remember that Uncle Byron didn't leave me. He came to see me once every six months, and he told you that he was going on a refresher course and he took extra shifts on duty and again to bring me a package to the prison. Your spouse, I know, tried to reconcile us because he repeatedly offered me to write to you, but I had a grudge against you since childhood and I told him about it. I told him that you put your job ahead of me and that you did. Don't argue with me now because I'll explain it to you later. Eventually I got out of detention and Byron came to my rescue. He offered to let me live in his apartment. I had no other choice, as I didn't want to go to you. And soon I met a man I fell in love with and got pregnant and then gave birth. That's when I found out about Byron's illness and he strictly ordered me not to tell you. Mom, your husband loved you very much. I envied you to tell you the truth. That's when I realized when I gave birth to my son and named him after Byron. I realized what a mother is and how I hurt you unfairly all that time. Wait, Julia, how did you get here? How did you get the keys? What are you looking for here? Samanda said incomprehensibly to her daughter. Julia looked at her mother with excitement and wanted to continue talking, but she couldn't because she cried and knelt down in front of her mother with the words, You forgive me. I am so guilty before you. I don't know how to apologize to you. It's just that Byron gave me the keys and told me before he passed away that in one of your books he left me and my son money. And he also took a promise from me that I would make peace with you. But I was afraid. So I came in here sneaking away from you. But you came in early from work today. I didn't expect this meeting myself as I wasn't prepared for it. Julia paused with these words. Samanda listened to her daughter's last words in silence and then lifted Julia from her knees and cried, 
as she had just realized that her husband, being seriously ill and noting that he had not long to live, was trying to reconcile her with her daughter. The woman realized that Byron loved her sincerely and she had doubted him for nothing. This realization pressed Samanda the most and at the same moment, she suddenly realized another thing as well, that she was now a grandmother. The woman only managed to utter, where is my grandson? Where is Byron? Mom, do you forgive me? Julia said with tears in her eyes. Oh, be quiet daughter, of course. I've wasted so much time. How old is my grandson? Samanda said quietly. He is two years old and he has seen his grandfather Byron. The young woman said, I want to see him. Samanda said and added, did you find the money Byron told you about? No, I don't remember your favorite book. Uncle Byron told me it was in your favorite book, Julia said. I know what edition it's in. Take the book, Singing in the Blackthorns, Byron, and I used to read it together, the woman said. Julia hugged her mother. Only now she realized how much she missed her mother and how much she missed her. The young woman could barely hold back the tears that had come again. Julia wanted at this moment to make her mother understand how remorseful she was for her behavior, and Samanda, sensing her daughter's condition, asked, Now you know what it is to be a mom, will you make my mistake? After all, once I gave myself to work simply, forgetting about you, and did not give that proper communication, which I should have given to my own child. Mom, I learned a good lesson, but I'll be honest, it was thanks to Uncle Byron. I'm happy for you and I hope that you and I will never be at odds again. Samanda said and then asked, Is the father of your child with you? He is my boy, just like I am your daughter. He and I broke up before Byron was born. And I'm grateful for that. Because he's not much of a father. Now, why don't we go get Byron? He can't stay without his mom for long. I left him with a friend. And now, when he finds out that he has a grandmother, he'll be happy because he's a loving kid, Julia said. What are you talking about? Sure, let's go. Daughter, I love you very much. I'm sorry for everything, said Samanda. Mom, I'm sorry too. I've made a lot of mistakes. And I'm grateful that you had a wonderful man in your life, whom you loved and he loved you, and who made me understand what love is, said Julia looking fondly at her mother.